pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tony Reed. Dr. Reed received his PhD degree at Stanford University in cancer biology and biochemistry and his MD degree also from Stanford. He then completed an internship and residency in internal medicine, followed by an oncology fellowship at Stanford. He served as a staff physician at the Stanford University and the VA Palo Alto before joining the faculty here at UCSD. Dr. Reed is a professor of clinical medicine, now emeritus, and also serves as the CEO and CSO of Epicentrics. His research focuses on the viral, targeted viral vectors for cancer therapy. He has over 100 publications and is a very well-renowned researcher in this field. He'll be presenting today on reversing tumor immunosuppression, an oncolytic virus targeting TGF beta. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I was asked to give like a little two or three minute vignette um, before starting this. Um, and, um, you know, so I grew up in Iowa. Uh, we had a little acreage, I had some horses and used to had a quarter horse and I used to race barrels with my, uh, with my horses. And uh, when I went to college, uh, you know, kind of being from the farming community, I was very interested in, in the environment. And so I was majoring in political science uh, with the idea of going to um, law school for, you know, environment, you know, protection of environmental things and stuff like that. You know, and along the way, uh, I needed a, a work study job. And I remember those are the days of the cork boards and three by five cards. Um, and uh, so I went to look for a work study job and the only job left on there was really taking care of uh, rodents in this uh, breast cancer research program. And I remember standing there quite deflated. Um, you know, I had no interest, you know, in, in, uh, in taking care of rodents or in cancer in particular, but, you know, it was the only job. And uh, so I did go there and they hired me and it turned out to be, you know, a very interesting. I was taking care of the rats and pretty soon I was asking about the experiments they were doing and pretty soon, I was helping them do their experiments and pretty soon I was doing their experiments for them. And then a little while into it, the chairman of the department came, asked to, asked to meet with me and I sat down in his office and he asked me what I planned to do. And I told him about going to law school and maybe being, you know, doing something in environmental work. And he asked me if I'd ever heard of something called an uh, MSTP program. And I <laughs> actually had never heard of it, never even thought of going to medical school. So he told me about this plan of getting an MD and a PhD. Um, and, um, you know, so I ended up, uh, I ended up going to, uh, to Stanford and doing an MD PhD there. Um, and uh, it's been uh, very fortunate. I've had a, a tremendous uh, number of uh, amazing people that I've met along the way, great faculty and colleagues at uh, Stanford and, and here at UCSD. Uh, very privileged and uh, very privileged to be able to give this talk today. Um, and one of the people I met was, and I actually worked in his lab, was George Stark, a fantastic guy. And he had a project looking at interferon. Um, and he was trying to understand at that time, interferon was uh, an interesting anti-cancer agent and, and they cloned a bunch of genes associated with interferon. And what I discovered um, you know, in working on that project was that many cancer uh, cell lines uh, actually um, had very blunted induction of some of these genes that we cloned that were interferon inducible. And I wanted to be able to show that uh, they were susceptible, highly susceptible to viral infection, even in the context of exposure to interferon. And that led to a uh, collaboration with Frank McCormick, who had founded Onyx Pharmaceuticals, um, on the idea that you can engineer viruses to attack cancer cells. And so um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start with a case. Uh, so this is a patient I saw some years ago. He's 56. Uh, he had stage 2 cancer, which recurred. He had a large uh, liver mass, which you can see here. Um, and it was microsatellite stable, had mutations, as most of these colon cancers do, and multiple genes. So in this particular case, P53KRAS and APC, a wild type for uh, BRAF and NRAS. Um, and so um, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this again and, and uh, talk about how we might treat that patient today based on you know, some of the things that I'm going to talk about. So overview of my talk, I'm going to give a general overview of oncolytic viruses and our experience of 
with Onyx 015, um, and describe a next generation oncolytic virus that we developed in our, uh, my laboratory called TAV255. Um, it's a potent and selective oncolytic virus, and it builds on the strengths and overcomes some of the limitations uh, that we uh, learned uh, from Onyx 015. It's truly a bench to bedside um, experience with Onyx running uh, over probably a dozen trials with hundreds of patients on them, um, and then back to the bench to uh, improve on that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the vector that's gone into the clinic now. It's called ADAPT-001. Uh, it's an oncolytic virus that expresses a transgene, um, and that transgene is a TGF beta receptor trap uh, with a goal of reversing immune suppression and essentially turning immunologic cold tumors to hot tumors. And uh, finally, I'm going to conclude with some combination studies that we've done with checkpoint inhibitors and uh, the uh, phase one trial that it's just uh, that started uh, earlier this year uh, called beta prime. So uh, uh, as a quick overview, the concept of oncolytic viruses, I'm sure many are familiar with, is that we can engineer viruses to uh, selectively infect uh, tumor cells and replicate in those uh, while uh, infecting normal cells, but not replicating. And um, you can generate thousands of viral particles. These can uh, cause lysis. Um, and here's just an electron micrograph showing the nucleus of a cell in these uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of viral particles kind of arrayed in the nucleus. Um, and uh, this picture really kind of depicts these viruses kind of moving through the tumor microenvironment. But uh, one of the things that I was very interested in is could we um, engineer these viruses to express transgenes uh, that could express uh, proteins selectively um, in the tumor microenvironment and change that in ways that uh, had therapeutic benefit. So just as a proof of concept, this is uh, uh, one of the first patients treated with Onyx 015. This is a, a patient uh, as you can see, has had prior surgery. Here's his surgical resection. He's had exposure to radiation and chemotherapy, and he has a local recurrence of this tumor. Um, and so this tumor was injected, uh, just a local injection uh, with Onyx 015. Um, and this is a good proof of concept that in this case, there was essentially a uh, total elimination of this tumor. Uh, and as you can see, very little uh, damage of any inflammation or irritation of this underlying tissue. Um, so this was a nice proof of concept that you really could engineer uh, viruses to selectively uh, destroy tumor cells without destroying the uh, normal tissue around it. That led to a series of studies that I did uh, in collaboration with and primarily focused on GI malignancies, which has been my interest, um, but using a, a special technique called arterial infusion. Um, hepatic artery infusion. And so um, if you notice, this is a, a angiogram of the liver. Um, and uh, what I'm pointing out here is a little catheter. So this is a fairly simple procedure. You uh, introduce this catheter uh, into the groin, uh, feed it up into the uh, common hepatic artery. And this is showing some contrast dye nicely illuminating the vasculature of the liver. Um, if you shoot another CT scan a fraction of a second later, you see that contrast dye move out of the arterial system um, and into these, which demarcated tumors. And what you see is uh, this contrast dye uh, localizing the hypermetabolic uh, regions of this tumor. Um, and so what you've achieved with this, um, in which uh, is um, a delivery of these uh, oncolytic viruses with very little dilution um, into this uh, arterial uh, bed before uh, uh, hitting the uh, tumor. And so we uh, use that uh, in a study, and um, I'm going to show you just a couple of patients. Um, uh, this is a, a patient that I treated. He was 39 years old, colon cancer, um, a nice guy, uh, but he'd failed all prior therapies uh, uh, available at that time. And this is a CT scan of his abdomen. You see these very large uh, uh, tumor masses within his liver. Um, and so uh, we did give uh, hepatic artery infusion uh, to this patient. Uh, he got uh, infused with Onyx 015. Um, so Onyx 015 is basically an adenovirus. It's a type 5 adenovirus that would cause a respiratory infection. So you would expect to see uh, cough and fever, uh, uh, runny nose. What was interesting about this patient is that um, he did uh, develop fevers, uh, 101, 102, uh, but he had no respiratory symptoms. He didn't actually have a cough. Uh, he didn't have a runny nose. Um, and his fevers lasted for a, about a week to 10 days. Um, and when we uh, did a follow-up CT scan three weeks later, what we could see is these tumors became very hyperemic. In fact, if you look at them pretty carefully, you can see that they actually look somewhat larger. 
Um, although different in context, uh, it looks like there's maybe less uh, contrast penetration into that despite you know, pretty uh, abundant vascular flow. Um, so what we did is uh, the patient actually felt a little bit better. He stayed on uh, treatment. And you can see over the next four months that these tumor masses are completely involuted. Um, and uh, by a year later, uh, these extensive tumors throughout his liver are largely gone and he's left uh, simply with some scar tissue uh, that was left behind. And this is one of the first examples where uh, we could do hepatic artery infusion, uh, treat these with an oncolytic virus um, and uh, achieve a, a clinical benefit. Now, of course, I'm showing you one of the best uh, examples, but certainly not the only one. Uh, this is another patient. Again, he failed all therapies. He's got a uh, very extensive disease throughout his liver. Uh, we treated him, and again, uh, like the previous patient, he developed uh, fevers, uh, chills, but no uh, respiratory symptoms, suggesting uh, localization of the infection to the tumor cells. And in fact, we see these tumors getting larger, um, and then over time, uh, involuting, and then finally, essentially going away completely. And in panel G, what I'm showing you here is the CEA. So this is a blood marker, and the um, arrows are the uh, doses of treatment. Um, so we can see his CEA rises uh, slowly over the first couple of treatments, but then abruptly rises and falls after his fourth treatment. And so in my laboratory at that time, we were interested in the cytokine profile and understanding, you know, uh, energy uh, in these patients and whether we uh, revert energy and turn these from kind of immunologically suppressed patients to immunologically uh, responsive patients uh, with treatment. So uh, what I'm showing you here is a cytokine profile. We did a, a bunch of cytokines, but I'm showing you uh, the kind of panel that we actually ended up looking at. It was interferon gamma, which is immunostimulatory, IL-6, and IL-10, which is an immunosuppressive. And what I'm showing you here in the open squares is the first treatment. So you can see that with the very first treatment with Onyx, this patient developed very low uh, induction of uh, immunostimulatory cytokines like interferon gamma. Um, and IL-6. In the dark squares is actually this fourth treatment. Uh, uh, with the fourth treatment, he developed this abrupt rise in CEA followed by clinical uh, regression of his tumors over time. And what we noticed is that he actually had a very profoundly different cytokine response. He had a very abundant response of interferon gamma, as we would expect in a patient exposed to uh, antivirus, um, and uh, notably uh, rise in IL-6 as well. Um, and then suppression of uh, IL-10, uh, suggesting that this patient now is in a more immunologically uh, responsive state. And um, so I put together uh, the results of all those patients. I actually got an award from a radiology society at the time, um, the uh, Young Investigator Award, uh, describing this activity of tumors getting larger before they got smaller when they were exposed to uh, potentially immunologic agent. Um, and what we did is take that panel of cytokines and stratify those that uh, went from kind of immunologic unresponsive to immunologic responsive tumors. Um, and when we did this in our panel of 35 patients that we treated with colon cancer, we got a very clear uh, separation um, in these patients. And notably those that turned uh, into immunologic responders by these criteria um, had a median survival of almost 18 months. Uh, and then for colon cancer, uh, 18 months median survival is almost as, at the time, was as good or better than we were doing with first-line untreated patients. So it became very clear that, you know, if you fell into this category of uh, you know, conversion to an immunologically uh, positive state with pseudoprogression of these tumors, uh, that you could have a very good response. And uh, this was kind of pre-immunology days, uh, immunotherapeutic days, but we see curves that look very similar to what we're seeing with checkpoint inhibitors, you know, with a 15 to 20 percent long-term survival, uh, which was quite remarkable because with extensive uh, chemorefractory colon cancer, you know, uh, long-term survival is extremely rare. Um, one of the other things that was very interesting, we published a paper on this, is as I showed you before. Uh, we treated these with direct injection of the antiviral particles into the hepatic artery. Uh, what, we, what we did see is regression of the tumors. What we did not see uh, was any evidence of any liver toxicity. Um, and we wrote a, a very detailed paper about that. But one of the things that was actually turned out to be interesting from this, and 
made me really convinced that we should follow up on uh, oncolytic viruses as a way to treat cancer in general, but in particular, uh, uh, disease metastatic to the liver, uh, was this finding uh, that's summarized in these couple of graphs that we published in that paper. Uh, what we did is we took normal bronchial epithelial cells, and these are the cells that uh, adenovirus would normally replicate in, um, and we can see, uh, this is a graph of number of viral uh, uh, platforming units uh, uh, per cell. Um, and you can see that each uh, infected cell produces uh, several thousand viral particles uh, in normal bronchial epithelium. But we also compared normal hepatocytes. Um, and these were uh, cells were infected, uh, an MOI of three, multiplicity of infection of three, so three viral particles per cell. So those three viral particle cell, uh, three particles turned into two or 3,000 in uh, normal respiratory epithelium, but did not, uh, uh, in fact, uh, had a loss of those in these uh, normal hepatocytes. What was interesting is that uh, transformed hepatocytes, so hepatocellular carcinoma, HEP 3B and HEP 2G, uh, produced uh, viral particles, as well as a colon cancer cell on HCT116, uh, the same as what we would expect for a respiratory epithelial cell. So somehow in the transformation from a normal hepatocyte uh, to a tumor cell, these replicate adenovirus very efficiently, uh, but in, intrinsically, uh, normal hepatocytes are not uh, susceptible to adenoviral infection. And what we found was actually quite interesting. Uh, the receptor for um, uh, adenovirus is called uh, CAR, the Coxsackie adenoviral receptor. And what we uh, discovered was that this was actually uh, an adhesion protein that is expressed at the uh, ba uh, basement membrane of hepatocytes, uh, completely away from the vascular sinusoids. So um, hepatocytes are intrinsically not infectable uh, by ad uh, adenovirus because the receptors are sequestered um, away from the uh, vasculature. Uh, so that led to this concept of polarity that we could potentially exploit with adenoviruses. That is, uh, what we found was that tumor cells lost their uh, polarity that they expressed as CAR receptor randomly all over the surface. So tumor cells could be infected, whereas normal hepatocytes, as we demonstrated clinically, could not. Um, so, um, so the Onyx experience spanned several hundred patients over a, couple, uh, over a dozen trials, um, and uh, was a great um, you know, bench to bedside experience to really think about how we would exploit the promise um, of oncolytic viruses and what were the limitations, both preclinically and clinically. So the promise of this is that we get tumor um, selective replication and lysis um, and uh, protection of normal cells. Uh, as I showed you, you could have extensive uh, disease throughout the liver with uh, extensive tumor lysis without uh, substantial uh, toxicity to liver. Um, but what it did allow us to do was uh, with selective infection of tumor cells, we could express therapeutic transgenes. Uh, so not only could we affect, uh, not only could we kill the infected cells, but we could alter the tumor microenvironment. And another thing that was actually very, I found very attractive about this was that it was a unique and, and non-cross-resistant killing. Um, uh, we looked at a large panel of cancer cells, the adenoviruses uh, kind of are, are uh, indiscriminate. Uh, they'll kill cells that have uh, KRAS mutations, MYC mutations, P53 mutations, doesn't really matter. Uh, so it was a, a unique and non-cross-resistant uh, non killing mechanism. Um, and then, as I showed you in the, in the previous paper we published, we saw uh, evidence of uh, activation of, immune, uh, uh, of the immune system and potential immune recognition of tumors. Um, Onyx 015 never uh, made it to the clinic. There were a, a number of problems. And one was, although it was heuristic at the time, uh, it, the concept was is that you could delete U1B55K because that was a viral protein that bound and inactivated P53. And so this would replicate selectively in P53 mutant tumors. That turned out not to be the case. Um, and although they didn't know it, this E1B55K protein has multiple splicing products that are involved in um, uh, viral replication. And so in the process of deleting this, we made a highly attenuated uh, uh, vector with low potency. So um, while I can show you selective patients uh, that are good proof of concept, uh, that, did, uh, that did great, it did point out the fact that we could probably do a lot better. Um, and the other thing about uh, Onyx is it did not have a transgene uh, built into it. Um, and so uh, we weren't taking advantage of the potential for uh, viral infection and expression of the transgene. So in my laboratory, we uh, started um, focusing on building the uh, next generation of oncolytic viruses. 
Um, this is, a, I thought, a fantastic opportunity because we had the extensive preclinical and clinical experience of, uh, of Onyx 015, many of those patients which I treated. Um, and so we had our goal of improving on that, improving the tumor selectivity, uh, enhancing the oncolytic activity and expressing transgenes uh, so that we could essentially create armed oncolytic viruses uh, that could have a specific uh, impact on the tumor and tumor microenvironment. So we did a lot of work. I'll summarize this basically in one slide. What we focused on was uh, not on the coding region of the adenovirus. Those are difficult to, uh, because there's a lot of splicing products and overlapping coding regions. Um, it's hard to delete critical antiviral um, uh, proteins without having uh, deleterious effects. But I was very interested in this concept of trophism. There are uh, 60 some strains of adenovirus and some will uh, infect the respiratory system and cause uh, upper respiratory fact, fact infections, but, but others will uh, infect the eye and cause uh, conjunctivitis and others will affect the GI tract. So there is a trophism. You can engineer viruses that are trophic for specific tumors. Um, and that was based really on the uh, uh, enhancer promoter region. Uh, so we did a very detailed analysis of that, and I'll show you kind of a summary. Here's a series of isolates that we made, and what I'm showing you is a Western blot of the MRC5, which are normal respiratory epithelial cells, and A549, which are cancer cells. Um, and what we're blotting for is E1A, which is the first viral protein that's made, which is essentially the master regulator for adenovirus. And the goal here would be to find um, a... Uh, an, uh, a, a um, variant of adenovirus with the deletion of its enhancer region uh, that did not express in normal cells, but did express very abundantly uh, in tumor cells. So here's wild type adenovirus uh, with E1A expressed. And in these various different uh, isolates that we made, we found one, which we call TAV255, that essentially produced no E1A. So this is essentially a dead adenovirus that produces a little if any viral particles because it's lost expression of its master regulatory gene U1A um, in normal respiratory epithelial cells. Um, but in tumor cells, you can see here's wild type adenovirus and here's TAV255. So we get abundant uh, expression of E1A really at the same level um, as uh, wild type adenovirus. So this gave us a huge therapeutic index. Um, and um, just to show you, um, here's uh, uh, respiratory epithelial cells grown in culture on a dish and we infect them with wild type adenovirus and expect that these would infect and kill these cells, uh, which we see uh, in this uh, micrograph taken seven days later. But this isolated TAV255 had no uh, impact, did not kill these cells. So uh, we have good protection of normal cells. Um, then we did a whole series of experiments. I'll just show you uh, one of many we did both in vitro and in vivo studies. Um, this is um, a, a KRAS mutant adenocarcinoma. Uh, in human and nude mice. Um, and what I'm showing you here is tumor volume over time. Uh, and these uh, animals got three injections three days apart uh, after the tumors reached about 50 uh, millimeters cubed. What you can see is the, um, those uh, treated with uh, control uh, grew rapidly and had to be sacrificed. Uh, whereas those that were treated with the uh, TAV255 uh, vector uh, were uh, effectively controlled. And here's a picture of those showing these large tumors um, and uh, some of the animals with the tumors uh, apparently eradicated and others with very small tumors. So this is a, a good uh, proof of concept that our oncolytic virus was uh, you know, uh, very um, potent uh, against these tumors. Um, and again, and none of these mice actually had any you know, systemic uh, toxicity from this, uh, from this virus. Um, what we went on to show then uh, was, and what I'm showing you here um, is a, uh, essentially a silver stain of protein expression. Um, and ILV11 is a laboratory isolate that we had uh, along the way. It's essentially a TAV255, um, the, kind of the parent to TAV255. Um, and what you can see is when you infect tumor cells that you start producing uh, viral proteins, hexon, penton, fiber, shown here. Um, but what you do see is uh, some of the uh, uh, cellular uh, um, proteins being shut off. And we were particularly interested in two proteins uh, that at the time um, were very difficult to generate small molecule inhibitors for, and one was MYC and the other was Survivin. So we wanted to determine whether um, an oncolytic virus uh, that we had made, ILV11, um, which again is the parent virus to TAV255, 
uh, could shut off these uh, oncolytic uh, pathways uh, and drug resistance pathways. So here's three cell lines, a colon cancer cell line, a lung cancer cell line, and a pancreatic cancer cell line. And we looked at the expression of MEK and Survivin uh, over 72 hours. And you can see that in colon cancer uh, and in uh, lung cancer uh, and in pancreatic cancer, we have pretty significant shutoff of MEK and substantial reductions of expression of Survivin. Now, these were important because at the time uh, we were getting some uh, small molecules uh, that were coming uh, into the clinic, um, often without as much benefit as we would like. Um, and so we wanted to know whether if we treated with this oncolytic virus, it suppressed uh, these various genes, some of them make some survive, and whether we could enhance the effect um, of some of these small molecules. And the model system we chose um, was erlotinib. Now, erlotinib was approved uh, for treatment of pancreatic cancer, um, but it was approved with about a two-week increase in median survival. So it was kind of the poster child for um, statistically significant, but not clinically relevant. Um, so we wanted to know whether um, treatment with um, this uh, 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 isolate, uh, MTAV255, could actually enhance the activity of a, of a small molecule inhibitor. So we chose um, erlotinib to look at. What I'm showing you here is a colony formation assay. So uh, we plate cells with, uh, plate, uh, we plate cells about 300 to ge generate about 300 colonies. Uh, I mean, about 50 to 100 colonies uh, on these plates. You can see that if you uh, treat these uh, with erlotinib, 10 micromolar, which exceeds what you can actually achieve clinically, um, that there was essentially no change in those uh, number of colonies are shown over here, uh, control and erlotinib in both um, lung cancer and colon cancer. Uh, so erlotinib had no effect on either lung cancer or colon cancer, but um, ILV-11 did. Uh, we had about a, as you can see here, for both these cell lines, about a 90% reduction in colony formation, but not complete eradication. Um, and what we did find uh, is when we combined both erlotinib um, along with uh, uh, ILV-11, uh, that we got uh, complete eradication uh, of these colony forming assays, which is uh, shown down here. So uh, we did an animal experiment uh, in these using uh, control and erlotinib treatment. Erlotinib had no effect, but the combination of the virus um, and virus plus erlotinib resulted in complete resolution of these tumors. So at that point, uh, you know, we felt like we had a very good oncolytic virus. Um, and so the next question was, you know, can we engineer it uh, into it a transgene uh, that would ex express from these infected cells um, uh, something that would alter the tumor microenvironment in ways that we thought would be beneficial? Um, and what we focused on was TGF beta. So, TGF beta basically creates a hostile environment, it induces immune suppression and tumor fibrosis. This becomes a big problem in pancreatic and colon cancer. Um, so what we've essentially created is an armed oncolytic virus that will infect and kill cells, but in the process of doing so, uh, what we did is engineer a TGF beta receptor trap. So this will bind and neutralize TGF beta with the general concept. Uh, so the idea of uh, um, inhibiting TGF beta is not new. Uh, there have been clinical uh, efforts to develop antibodies that will neutralize in a clinical way TGF beta. Uh, the problem with those is they have significant toxicity. So uh, administering, uh, it had it, it, in those clinical studies, you had to administer high doses of these uh, antibodies. Uh, so you got high systemic concentrations with very low uh, intratumoral uh, penetration. Uh, so our concept here would be kind of an inside out approach where we would uh, express the TGF beta trap uh, from within the tumor. So we got high concentrations with within the tumor um, and diminishing concentration systemically. So just quickly about TGF beta, um, one of its main functions is really a normal tissue repair. So when uh, tissues are damaged, um, they can become inflamed. Uh, the, if the infection then goes away, um, TGF beta uh, is in its biologically active form will essentially shut off uh, these immune cells uh, to allow uh, the uh, tissue to quiet down and then induce formation of, uh, of matrix proteins and tissue repair. So we can, so cancers are often described as non-healing wounds. Um, and this normal process of tissue repair becomes abnormal in tumors where this is constitutively overexpressed, uh, resulting in immune suppression um, and uh, abnormal fibrosis. 
So here's just a depiction this is of, of TGF beta and some of the suppressive activities where it can uh, inhibit uh, T cell CD8 and CD4, natural killer cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, and neutrophils. So potent immune suppression from TGF beta. And you can imagine uh, that if you're overexpressing this in the uh, tumor microenvironment due to a non healing wound, uh, that you get a, uh, a fibrotic and immune suppressed environment. Uh, TGF beta is overexpressed in a wide variety of cancers, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. Uh, I'll just show you a couple. This is breast cancer. Uh, these are triple negative breast cancer. Um, and so here's an example of a tumor nest of a triple negative breast cancer with marked overexpression of TGF beta. So um, colon cancer is another one. Uh, there are consensus molecular phenotypes uh, for colon cancer. Uh, the consensus molecular phenotype one is uh, the immune category. These are well where the, um, those with uh, microsatellite instability tend to fall. Um, the others, CMS2, 3, and 4, um, are characterized by overexpression of RAS mutations. But CMS4 is in particular a bad actor. These are the ones that um, have diminished overall uh, time to regression and overall survival. Uh, and they're characterized by marked overexpression of TGF beta and marked stromal infil infiltration. So these are very fibrotic tumors with overall po pro uh, poor prognosis. So, uh, so we envision being able to use our oncolytic virus not only to kill the colon cancer cells primarily, but hopefully uh, to revert uh, this uh, from a, uh, by inactivation of TGF beta. Um, and uh, revert that ex, uh, overexpression and hopefully also uh, diminish the stromal uh, fibrosis. Um, and this is uh, largely work um, you know, the, of Chris uh, Larson in our laboratory, but we engineered um, a um, uh, TGF beta receptor trap. Uh, this is linked to immunoglobulin and heavy chains, uh, just kind of depicted here. We had to engineer this in a way that we could express from the uh, coding region of the virus. Um, and um, uh, we received, uh, in fact, uh, we, we received uh, uh, patent awards for the base vector, uh, the uh, expression vector that we created, as well as uh, this novel construct of a way to create a receptor trap that can be expressed um, uh, from, this, uh, from the antiviral vector. And just to show you that uh, this, uh, the activity of this, so TGF beta uh, signals through SMAD, um, and so what we're looking at is phosphorylation of SMAD protein. So this is a Western blot shown here. Um, and you can see this is a control line with no phosphosmad, but the uh, proteins are present, SMAD proteins are present. In the presence of TGF beta, that is phosphorylated. Um, in the presence of TGF beta with the base vector that does not express the uh, receptor trap protein, we can see it's still uh, uh, expressed. But now, uh, if we combine it with uh, our, our oncolytic vector that expresses the TGF beta receptor trap, uh, we can see that that completely inactivates um, uh, uh, the phosphorylation of SMAD, uh, demonstrating uh, inactivation of, uh, of free TGF beta 2. So we went on then to do, uh, this just shows the depiction of that. This is the TAV255 backbone with cloning insertion site in it and the TGF beta receptor trap inserted into it. Um, and we looked at two, uh, three different cell lines, one colon cancer, or one uh, lung cancer cell line and two normal cell lines. Um, so without virus, uh, these uh, cells grow very well. Uh, with the uh, parent vector, without TGF beta receptor trap, uh, we can show that within uh, two to four days, we get essentially complete killing of these cells. Um, also, the uh, vector that expresses a TGF beta receptor trap is also effective at killing. So we did not lose any of the oncolytic activity of the virus, but we now express high levels of the TGF beta trap. Um, and what was uh, important was that normal cells, respiratory epithelial cells, um, were not uh, significantly harmed uh, uh, in, uh, by this virus. Um, we then went on to look at a panel of, colon, uh, of cancer cells. Um, this is just a sample of those. Um, and we looked at viral infection with increasing multiplicity of infection from one to three to 10. Um, and you can see that uh, we have substantial reduction of uh, cell viability with lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, uh, uh, significant uh, killing, but not complete with uh, a melanoma. And uh, uh, what was quite remarkable is hepatocellular cancers uh, 
are extremely sensitive to this. So even one viral particle of a cell uh, essentially eradicated uh, HCC cells um, and also significant activity in squamous cell. Um, we then looked at cell vi viability in a panel of normal cells. You can see essentially 100% viability across the board, uh, even up to 10 viral particles per cell for dermal fibroblasts, two different uh, respiratory uh, cells, melanocytes and hepatocytes. So we have a very good uh, oncolytic activity with this uh, vector uh, without significant toxicity to normal cells. Uh, we then went on to do uh, a toxicology study. Uh, this is uh, just looking at a dose escalation of the vector that expresses the TGF beta receptor trap. And this is the weight of these animals. So no toxicity up to uh, 10 to the ninth uh, um, uh, particles per cell in these animals. Uh, we then uh, went to look at the effect of, on tumor cells. Uh, so uh, animals, again, treated with dose escalation, uh, but this time treating the tumor cells. Uh, we didn't see much activity at 10 to the seventh, but by 10 to the eighth viral particles per cell, we were getting very significant activity. And by 10 to the ninth, uh, with three doses of, uh, of this virus given at this point, we have complete eradication of this KRAS mutant uh, uh, mouse adenocarcinoma. Um, so uh, we then wanted to actually find out how long the TGF beta trap remained in circulation. Uh, so we uh, looked at the uh, uh, levels of the TGF beta trap. Um, uh, so we were getting uh, about 10 to 20 nanograms per mil in the circulation uh, day two, and that persisted uh, with nanogram uh, per mil levels all the way out to day 14, again, with no uh, significant toxicity from these animals. So. This is good proof of concept that we can get uh, oncolysis of the infected tumor cells, uh, but this can result in uh, sustained and persistent systemic delivery of the transgene of our choice in this particular case, the TGF beta receptor trap. So we then went on to uh, look at this uh, um, vector, the TGF beta receptor trap uh, in uh, tumor cell lines. And this is uh, a mouse adenocarcinoma. Uh, these are uh, treated. Uh, uh, with a uh, control buffer, three doses, and all of these, it's a very aggressive uh, model. So most of these animals have to be sacrificed by uh, around four weeks. Um, however, uh, if we treat it with the uh, base parental vector without TGF beta receptor trap in it, uh, we see that we cure about uh, four out of 10 um, at this particular dose. And I'm highlighting in red something that we see consistently and kind of parallels what we saw in the humans, and that is that these tumors can become inflamed and enlarged um, over the course of a couple of weeks um, and then regress and, uh, and go away. Uh, when we added the TGF beta receptor trap to this, what we can see is that we now uh, have very effective killing you know, of this tumor, curing about 80% of these animals. Uh, so we have now potent uh, a direct oncolysis from the antiviral vector um, and uh, activity uh, from the TGF beta receptor trap, which are um, uh, uh, synergistic. Um, so one of the things that we thought was very interesting is, you know, because we're now routinely curing 80 to 100 percent of these animals uh, with this vector with TGF beta in it, we wondered if we took these animals um, and then uh, kept them around for four months and to ensure that they had complete cure of these uh, tumors and then re-injected them with tumor cells with no further treatment, and, you know, what would happen? Uh, can we get uh, tumor uh, uh, memory? So in the control animals, you can see we injected them uh, with these uh, same tumor cells that they had been exposed to before. And in the naive animals, uh, we had, uh, uh, had to sacrifice them again by around uh, uh, four weeks or so um, with uh, large tumors. What we did notice in the, uh, what we observed in the um, re-challenged experiments is that the tumors would come up um, but then they would regress, um, and we had uh, complete protection of these uh, um, uh, tumor cell lines after being uh, uh, cured by the prior uh, treatment with the um, um, uh, TGF beta receptor trap vector. So uh, we very uh, so we actually did multiple experiments with this, and um, uh, this was a, a nearly overall all over the various experiments we did nearly 100 animals this way. That's even more than that now. Uh, these are two separate experiments we showed here, um, but we can see it in the naive animals, again, uh, these uh, grow rapidly and have to be sacrificed by around four weeks. 
Um, but in the animals that uh, uh, had previously been cured uh, by the uh, TGF beta receptor trap, we do see the tumors come up um, and then they uh, go away. And this was uh, 40 out of 40 animals in this particular experiment where uh, the tumors were injected that had been previously cured from that. So um, we did then look at these tumors um, in terms of what they look like under the microscope. And this is after uh, 10 days exposure. So these are control tumors. These look much like what we see in our, in our patients, essentially a bland uh, tumor with no inflammatory infiltrate. Uh, when we infect, and these are three separate animals, what you can see is an intense inflammatory infiltrate uh, into these tumors uh, in all of these with extensive uh, necrosis of the uh, tumor in the background. Uh, so we do see very clear infl inflammatory infiltrate uh, into these um, otherwise uh, uh, immune deserts uh, uh, in this particular model. So with that, you know, I want to, we're now set the stage to um, look at, can we now uh, enhance the effect of uh, other therapies that we have available? Uh, everyone knows this, but checkpoint inhibitors have now been around for uh, uh, you know, over six years, uh, first approved in 2014 for melanoma. What's been disappointing for us in the GI world is there very limited activity uh, to these uh, checkpoint inhibitors for GI malignancies. Um, this is just a, a sample of some of the publications that have come out. Uh, you know, in 2010, some of the first reports of, col of colon cancer uh, treated with uh, CTLA-4 uh, no uh, no uh, responses were observed in uh, 50 uh, patients. Uh, Follow-up uh, studies uh, published with pdl one inhibitors, uh, both in New England Journal uh, in 2012, again showed no uh, objective responses uh, in the uh, patients treated in the colorectal cancer cohorts. What was happening, though, is that uh, in some of these uh, uh, studies, you would occasionally see patients who had a very a robust response um, and what it turned out to be was those were patients who had mishmash repair Lynch syndrome uh, 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 type syndrome. Um, and so there was a, 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 a study that was done that looked specifically at uh, patients who have mishmash repair deficiency. Um, and just to summarize that for you, in the keynote 177, uh, PEMBRO was used in these microsatellite uh, uh, in, in unstable uh, advanced colorectal cancers. Um, and so um, these represent a small fraction of our colon cancer patients, only a, uh, about 3% of metastatic colon cancer will have microsatellite instability. Um, but if they do, the results of this, which was again, uh, which was published was remarkable. Uh, this was a comparison uh, of standard chemotherapy uh, versus uh, uh, pembrolizumab in these microsatellite unstable patients. Um, and so uh, even out to three years, uh, nearly half of these patients are still alive, uh, which for colon cancer uh, is quite remarkable, uh, where we expect that most of these patients will uh, progress um, by uh, uh, six to eight months, um, and uh, very few of them will be alive out at three years, uh, probably less than 10%, which is as shown here. So uh, very remarkable response um, in, uh, in that small percentage, about 3% that have microsatellite instability, uh, but essentially no activity in metastatic colon cancer. So there have been efforts uh, to convert these other 97%. Can we find a way to make checkpoint inhibitors work? Um, and one of the most promising concepts uh, was to use a MEK inhibitor. Uh, and uh, I was an investigator on this trial. It was a very uh, popular trial. People wanted to be on this. Um, and this uh, used uh, Genentech's uh, PD-01 antibody atezolizumab uh, with and without cobimetinib. And they compared it to uh, standard, uh, this is a multi-kinase inhibitor regorafenib uh, that we commonly use in um, uh, phase uh, in, in, in third line colon cancer patients. Now this was approved with a 1.8 month increase in time to progression. Uh, so uh, not a high bar here with uh, only a, a comparison to, to regorafenib that gives uh, a little over a month and a half increase in uh, time, time to progression. Uh, the results of this, uh, however, were resoundingly disappointing. Um, regorafenib, um, which is uh, considered a relatively low bar here, um, did have a median time to progression of uh, right around two months, uh, but neither atezolizumab uh, alone or in combination with covimetinib, did any better than regorafenib. 
so um, this was a very large trial, uh, you know, several hundred patients, you know, pretty clearly showing that checkpoint inhibitors you know, have no uh, impact uh, in microsatellite stable colorectal cancer. Um, and uh, that cannot, could not be improved by a combination with cobimetinib. So to get to a little bit of insight into this, we can turn to uh, some of the studies that are done in, col in lung cancer. And so in lung cancer, um, there was a study done that looked at first-line PEMBRO, uh, but specifically for those that were PD-L1 uh, positive. So these are uh, lung cancers that are uh, 50, that express 50% uh, pd one um, and um, what we can see is those that uh, overexpress pd one uh, have a very uh, robust response uh, compared to chemotherapy alone, and now this is uh, first-line therapy, you know, for these uh, uh, um, pd one overexpressing cancers and lung cancer. But this uh, trial specifically uh, omitted any patient that had uh, a mutation in EGFR. So uh, there was a subsequent publication, what happens if you have an uh, EGFR mutation? And, and remember, uh, EGFR mutations are, are very common in colon cancer. And the answer to that was in this subsequent publication was a phase two study of PEMBRO, but with EGFR mutant tumors. Uh, again, we're looking at pd one positive. And in this uh, particular paper, uh, they separated those that had over 50% uh, pd one expression versus those between one and, and 49. They had no response whatsoever. Uh, so in lung cancer, where you can get a very positive response in the absence of an EGFR mutation, uh, in the presence of those, you have complete loss of uh, uh, immune responsiveness to, uh, uh, to PEMBRO in this particular case. So I want to remind you again that KRAS mutations are a common problem uh, in, uh, in colon cancer, where KRAS and BRAF mutations uh, affect probably uh, 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 the majority of our patients. Uh, and then I also want to hi highlight again that TGF beta overexpression um, affects another 20 uh, quarter of these patients. So between mutation in the TGF beta and KRAS, as well as other mutations, probably 85 to 90% of our uh, patients will fall into uh, what looks to be a highly immunosuppressive group. And in clinical practice, um, as I just showed you with the Emblaze trial, uh, that was uh, clearly the case. So we then went back to the laboratory and asked the question, you know, can we combine our TGF beta receptor trap with a, uh, uh, a checkpoint inhibitor? Uh, and this is an example of one of those experiments. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is tumor volume in a spider plot. Uh, these got three injections of um, our um, oncolytic virus expressing a TGF beta receptor trap intratumorally and four injections uh, of anti, a mouse anti pd one antibody. Uh, this was uh, kind of a standard uh, injection protocol that was used in many uh, rodent experiments at the time for uh, various cancers, including, uh, including melanoma. Uh, what we can see here in the spider plot is that these tumors all progress and again, uh, have to be sacrificed around 30 days. Um, the addition of intraperitoneal uh, treatment with a uh, checkpoint inhibitor had very little impact on this. Um, but when we uh, treated these animals with our TGF beta receptor trap vector, uh, we cured about half of these animals, as we can see here. Um, and when we combine that now with uh, our TGF beta receptor trap plus a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, we're routinely getting 80 to 90% cure rates uh, in these animals. So um, I'll just show you another experiment plotted a little bit differently. It makes this point a little bit uh, more evident. Uh, this is the progression-free survival in these animals. Uh, what we can see here in the yellow is uh, control vehicle only. Uh, in green is those animals that were treated with checkpoint inhibitor. So uh, like our uh, experience in, in colon cancer, no activity. Um, when we treat with a TGF beta vector alone, we, uh, in this particular experiment, cured 70% of these animals, long-term survival out at two months. And this goes to 90% with a combination of uh, checkpoint inhibitor. So, um, our next experiment was then to ask the question, can, uh, can, what happens if we have uh, essentially the equivalent of a metastatic tumor? So we uh, used a bilateral model where there's a primary tumor uh, on the left side that was treated um, and an untreated tumor on the right side. And these are plotted somewhat differently, but I'll just walk you through this again. This is uh, progression-free survival 
for the control animals, again, they all uh, have to be sacrificed by around 30 days. Uh, in the dotted line is the uh, pd one antibody, no benefit here. Um, and in the primary tumor, we saw 60% of these uh, uh, were cured, and this went to 100% in the group that was uh, received both the TGF beta receptor trap vector and uh, the, the mouse checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, turning to the secondary tumor, now this tumor had no treatment at all. Again, uh, with vehicle or checkpoint inhibitor, there was no benefit and these had to be uh, sacrificed. Um, but with the uh, TGF beta vector uh, itself, uh, we get very good control of the secondary tumor. And when we combine it with a checkpoint inhibitor, we had essentially complete eradication of uh, uh, not only the primary uh, treated tumor, but the secondary untreated tumor. So, uh, so with that, we felt we had um, a, uh, uh, a vector that we could take to the clinic. Um, we did, we went through the uh, process of GMP manufacturing, um, presented to this, this to the FDA and got FDA approval. Um, and now we have gone fully from bench to bedside, back to the bench, and now back to the bedside again. Uh, so our uh, phase one trial, which is now open uh, and enrolling, is called Beta Prime, TGF Beta. Uh, it's a phase one trial in humans uh, to study the safety and efficacy. And what we're calling our clinical uh, uh, vector that expresses TGF Beta trap is ADAPT-001. Um, and this is for patients with uh, refractory solid tumors. Uh, this is essentially a three-stage trial. Uh, we'll treat uh, as a dose escalation for a standard uh, kind of phase one, uh, and then this will be expanded uh, to multi-dosing and then combination dosing with checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so uh, we're well into this trial now um, and very encouraged by the progress that we've made. So turning to the case that we started with, um, you know, this was uh, a patient uh, that I saw. He was a uh, a surfer, he was out surfing one day and noticed this firm mass in his abdomen uh, came in. He had a large tumor here. Uh, this was five or six years ago. We treated him with pretty aggressive therapy, uh, a full fox Erie with Avastin. He actually had a pretty good response and eventually did get to surgical resection. Uh, we removed these hepatic tumors, but unfortunately, um, he's microsatellite stable with mutant KRAS and P53 and APC. Um, he uh, did have recurrent tumor um, and uh, eventually died um, from disease progression. Um, ideally, uh, what we would like to do is be able to uh, do what I showed at the beginning, do a hepatic artery infusion uh, into these tumors and give systemic delivery. Um, instead of being the Onyx virus, we're going to have uh, the ADAPT-01, which is more tumor selective and more potent and also expresses TGF-beta um, and hopefully uh, we'll have uh, more patients being converted to surgical resection um, and uh, better outcomes from those as well. So I'd like to kind of summarize uh, the talk so far, uh, this ADAPT-01 summary. The uh, ADAPT-01 expresses TGF beta receptor trap um, and it's built on the preclinical and clinical experience of Onyx-015. Um, I we do think this has a, a, a real potential value in the clinic. It has a unique non-cross resistant mechanism tumor killing. So we have oncolysis that is independent of whatever uh, tumor mutation is present. KRAS, BRAF, uh, doesn't really matter in all our model systems. Um, and not only can we induce oncolysis in killing those tumors, but we can express transgenes, particularly the TGF beta receptor trap. And we've shown that that can be present in the circulation for at least two weeks following treatment, giving uh, 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 prolonged systemic delivery uh, following local administration, uh, turning essentially cold, immunologically cold tumors to hot tumors. Um, and hopefully, uh, as we've seen in uh, our animal model system, we induce tumor memory. Uh, we'll be looking to see if that actually uh, is a, a, an effect that we see in the clinic as well. And as I mentioned, uh, we have already started clinical testing uh, for the beta uh, prime clinical trial. Uh, using this, uh, uh, what we call ADAPT-01. Uh, with that, you know, I'd like to I have a lot of people to thank for this. I, I've been extremely fortunate to work with um, the fantastic colleagues, uh, both at Stanford uh, and here at UCSD. Uh, we have an incredible uh, faculty 
um, and an incredible resource. Um, over the years, uh, collaborated uh, with Mike Bouvet in surgery um, and uh, Andy uh, Kummel um, as well, who's focusing on uh, nanoparticles. Uh, most of the work, I just want to highlight, uh, you know, two people who've done a lot of this. Um, you know, Farah uh, uh, Etrin uh, joined me um, and really did uh, the majority of the work to make the, the base vector and do a lot of the analysis that led to um, uh, ADAPT-01. Um, Chris Larson has also, also done a tremendous amount of work and uh, particularly in generating uh, the um, uh, TJET beta vector. Uh, this has now moved into the clinic. We have a very large uh, clinical team that's now working on this uh, through uh, uh, the company uh, Epicentrics that we founded uh, to move this uh, technology forward. Um, and um, uh, so we're very excited about the opportunity uh, for this and very appreciative of the opportunity to present it to uh, the faculty. Dr. Reed, thank you so much for that really impressive presentation. We have a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, a question that says, Patrick Lee advanced an oncolytic rheovirus as a therapy in KRAS, KRAS expressing tumors. Has there been any work with combining therapies with different oncolytic viruses that target different drivers of transformation? Yeah, so um, so one of the reasons, that's a great question. Uh, and so one of the reasons that we focused on adenoviruses um, uh, is uh, that there are numerous serotypes that intrinsically uh, have a different spectrum of activity. Um, and so, um, you know, so we're, we're building on that to uh, create other isolates. So uh, when I was uh, um, when I was still back at Stanford, I did a collaboration um, um, with a, a group at Bayer uh, Pharmaceuticals with Terry Hermiston, um, and we focused on a different serotype. Um, and that actually has uh, moved into the clinic as well. Um, and over the years, I've done studies with uh, herpes, vaccinia, uh, a variety of other vectors, um, and all of them have uh, different advantages and disadvantages. Uh, uh, so I do think that there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for engineering um, uh, oncolytic viruses uh, going forward. Um, we focused on adenovirus for the reasons uh, that I mentioned in particular, uh, because we can get controlled and high level expression of therapeutic transgenes. Um, I've shown you one, TGF beta. We have uh, a variety of others that I think answer your question that where the transgene expression is really engineered to focus on a particular tumor type and feature of that particular tumor microenvironment. And then another question, how do receptors which are absent in tumor cells contribute to anaplastic behavior as opposed to receptors which are induced in tumor cells that can be blocked? Um, I'm not sure exactly what that question is about. The antivirus it, um, does uh, infect cells through the Coxsackie antivirus receptor. Um, and we and others have shown that the expression level of um, the CAR receptor can be variable. Um, and um, one of the things is those receptors can be induced. You know, for example, um, we show this in preclinical models with HDAC inhibitors and other laboratories have done that as well. So uh, it's possible to induce CAR receptors uh, in, uh, in CAR low or CAR uh, negative cells. Uh, but that does get to the point of the collaboration with uh, Dr. Kummel, um, where we're working on encapsulating our adenovirus uh, in nanoparticles that can um, uh, bypass the need to have CAR receptors. So in particular, uh, hematologic malignancies that uh, do not express uh, CAR receptors as, as class um, are now uh, uh, types of malignancies that we can treat uh, based on the work that we've done with Dr. Kummel. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. We're so grateful to you. I hope all of you will join us next week for Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Have a nice Thanks, day. Everyone.